Good morning. Man, isn't it an exciting time to be a part of Faith Church? Um, just a couple of things before we, before we jump in. Um, this is the time of year that we look forward to. Parents may be looking really forward to it. Back to school uh, is here. We're tuning back to our regularly scheduled, all of the things going on. And so as a church body, we want to invest in our schools and in those relationships. We don't just throw money at it. It's a way to develop a relationship. And how many know the relationship is the bridge to life change and community and believing that it's gonna happen in the hearts and lives of people. So when you invest to things like the back to school outreach and the kingdom builders, it gives us an opportunity to do that. So I wanna strongly encourage you, maybe you're back to school shopping or maybe uh, you no longer have the back to school shopping needs. There are people in our community that need that and we'd love to partner uh, with them in that. Also, we're doing something crazy. On the way out the door, uh, we have a little station as you walk out the door to the right and uh, we have thank you cards, and they're just very simple thank you cards. And I'm gonna ask you, maybe on your way out, grab one of these and write a quick note of affirmation to some of our teachers. How many know they need it? They're on the front lines, uh, raising the next generation, pouring into the next generation, uh, teaching the next generation. And so we wanna, we wanna do this as a church body that just says, hey, this is, you're awesome, you're great. I love what you do. Thank you for your service. Thank you for, for investing in the next generation. So that's there for you, and you fill it out, and you just drop it back in that box that's out there. So we'd love to do that for our schools and our, our community. Amen? Hey, we are starting our new series on uh, frequency. And uh, before we jump in, just, just want to tell you, man, if, if, if you're new here, if you're watching online, the presence of the Lord is in this place. And man, I'm telling you, uh, the way the worship was going, prophetic words coming forth that, that you need to know this morning that God is a God of grace, that he is here, that he is alive, that he is active, that he is pursuing you, and that he is, he is here this morning, and he has a word for you this morning that will receive you and convict you and love on you and, uh, and meet you right where you are. And so that's the God we serve. We're in our series, we're in our series called Frequency, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if you saw that trailer um, how many of you used to have a radio like that or similar? For those of you who don't know, that was a radio. It had dials and buttons and knobs that you would turn to try to tune, to try to find some things. Uh, so, some of you young people, we, we didn't have the Apple Fi, the Spotify, all the Fi's. You couldn't yell, Alexa, play this. You, Echo, I need this song. That, 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 that was a common thing. A radio. Any radio people in your car? Like it's radio. All right, that's okay. It's okay to be a radio person. Uh, radio people. Uh, how many of you got your preset stations? You know, the commercial comes on to the next one, to the next one. You got, you got your preset. Any of you travel to another city and you get frustrated with radio? Like, don't they know the upper 100s is my genre? And now you put this genre in it? And I hate country. Why is this here? And why is it? And you start moving and you start changing. And when you change radio, what do you have to do? You have to hit that scan, that seek button, that, that dial there. We're in this series where we, we did that kind of as a picture because there's a couple things that come out of the radio there's a couple of things that come out maybe when you're searching that you will hear. I wanna, I wanna point out two things. You'll hear static. I hate static unless I'm going to bed and it's white noise. Like I hate, I hate static when I'm looking for something. It's grating, it's obnoxious, it drowns out where I'm trying to get to. The next thing, the next thing you'll hear coming out, out of a radio is always a sense, a wide variety of voices a wide variety of personalities, preferences, and opinions, angles, genres, beliefs, all coming out of these voices. And I think why, why we're looking at this, why that radio is kind of our, our picture, is that we, as children of God, are desperately trying to tune in and to hear his voice. I mean, as a Christ follower, that's the voice that we want to follow. That's what we want leading us. And yet there is all these grating noises, 
opinions, agendas, voices, things coming at us from every direction. And it's hard to hear the voice of God. Hard to tune in to the voice of God. Our goal in this series is to answer some of those questions and in the clouding and in the noise. What, that question, what does his voice sound like? How do I hear his voice? Before we, before we really dive in, this, this Sunday, this week, we're gonna, we're gonna look at a heart posture. A heart posture that's needed to receive the word of God, to hear the word of God, to have that, how we somewhat position ourselves to tune in to what he's saying. We're also this morning gonna examine some noises, some agendas, some things that get in the way from that clear communication. So Luke chapter eight, Luke chapter eight, if you have your Bibles, take them out, stand with me for the reading of God's word, Luke chapter eight. I wanna share with you a message called the prepared heart, the prepared heart. And then this passage is very familiar. If you've been attending church at any time, you've probably heard this story. And Jesus shares a parable of a farmer who scatters seeds, and he scatters seeds across four different kinds of soil. And the draw from here, it's the condition of the soil, listen to me, that actually determines the harvest. It's the condition of the heart, the soil, that actually determines the fruit. Luke chapter eight, picking up at verse four. While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow a seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell along the rocky ground. When it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plant. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. In this little section, the disciples have no clue what he's talking about. So Jesus actually interprets this for us and them. Verse 11, it says, the meaning of this parable, the seed is the word of God, and those along the path are the ones who hear, and the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Father, today I pray, as we look at your word, God, I thank you that you are here. I thank you that your presence is here. I thank you that your grace is here. I thank you that you're calling us, that you are here, you are alive, and you are active. So Lord, I pray as we look at your word as maybe a familiar parable, maybe one we've heard time and time again, God, I pray that you would open up our hearts to receive it. God, it would produce change, it would produce fruit in us. We love you, Jesus, in your name we pray, amen, amen. As you're seated, tell your neighbor they look good. If you're here with us or if you're following online, if you're taking notes, we have that version app. And we're gonna look at these four soils. We're gonna apply them to heart postures and hearing from the, from the Lord. So number one, you're gonna see the first soil is a polluted heart, a polluted heart. It says that it's a path, they hear it, and then it's this, this, the progression, it's a path, they hear it, and then it's snatched away. If you, if you look at it, the first type of soil isn't really soil at all. It's a pathway. It's a roadway. Now, in the ancient world, if you needed to get from point A to point D, B, you didn't uh, jump in the SUV or the minivan and get there. Uh, you were walking either by foot or by animal. And, and that path, how I many you know the more people traveled on it, the more it got worn down, the more the path becomes any grass, any vegetation, it would all be worn away, it would be dirty, it would be dusty, it would be compacted. And over the, over the years, making that soil literally hard, literally compact, almost impenetrable. And even on the sides of the path where some of the seeds scattered, there could be little or no vegetation. Uh, we, we have where our house is, we live on close to a pretty busy road. And my, I have the responsibility, there's a ditch, and I have the responsibility of kind of weed eating and maintaining that area, as well as the department, highway department, which their maintenance is like once every five months. 
Um, mine, mine, I'm working in the ditch. And it is amazing, amazing what people like throw away, what falls off the car, what our ditch collects. Uh, so I'll be weeding in, and I'm like, literally, this just happened. There's a, there's a shovel. And that's a pretty nice shovel. And I'll keep that treasure, as Pastor Larry would say. I'll, I'll keep that treasure, and, and I'll have that. I'll be weeding. I, I kid you not, I found a massive section of a radiator just in that ditch. I'm like, I think this is necessary for your travel. I don't know what happened to you, why this is here, where you, where you in where, where you ended up. You find all kinds of cans, all kinds of trash, underwear. I don't know if you need them or don't need them or why you disposed of these, uh, but I'm not gonna touch those. I'm gonna let the ditch take that downstream. I'm gonna let that, let that one go. All kinds of stra- all kind of litter, all kinds of clutter, all kinds of stuff coming, coming in that. And that's kind of the picture that we're getting Jesus said some fell along the path in the side of this well-worn, hard pathway. It's kind of this picture of where decisions have been made, baggage has been gained, hurt and pain. It's trampled on. It's tough to find joy. It's tough to find growth. It's littered with failures. It's a little littered with mistakes. It's littered with sin. And it's no wonder that the Bible, one of its most common phrases to describe a person who is far from God is one of a hard heart, one of a hard heart. And then there's this, there's this bird that's described, and, and the, the, the explanation is that this is the deceiver, this is the accuser, this is the devil who speaks to this path, who has control of this path, it's a time of life. They have no idea, the enemy and the bird and the existence that the desire is to kill, steal, and destroy any good and beneficial thing coming out of their life. This bird, this enemy, will twist the truth about Jesus and the gospel and the good news. It's rejected, kind of like the frequency. It's God's voice is skipped over as they hear him calling to him. Skipped over for another station where the enemy is encouraging them to remain where they are, to to just, it's okay to sin, it's okay to stay there, it's okay to embrace the hardness of the heart. I just want to say on a side note, if you're here or watching online and, and you've been hardened by maybe your actions or things that have been done to you or things that have spoken over you, the Bible says that while we, you and me, while we were still sinners, while I and you were in hostility, while we were moving a different direction, while we were hard and impenetrable, the Son of God willingly came to earth and died for you. And during the penalty that you deserve to take and during that he took death he took the place for you and for me he stepped forward to do that and that same Jesus still calls to that path he and he can wipe away the accumulated garbage from your life he can he can give you a new and softened heart that's free to love him and love others again that you can hear you can hear him again the path the pathway the polluted heart number two the distracted heart. Verse six, it says that some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. He explains this in verse 13. He says, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy and when they hear it, but they have no root. They don't go deep. It says they believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. Agricultural played an important role in Jesus' community so that they would know that when a farmer approached a field that he wished to plant, he must remove all the boulders, all the rocks, all the sticks, all the old root systems. Essentially, he has to remove anything or everything that could disrupt or distract those roots from going deep and producing and yielding crop. And in this progression, we're told that this distracted heart, it receives the message of Jesus with gladness. But the rocky ground, the roots, they, they can't go deep. And because of these rocks, because of these roots, because of these distractions, it can't get moisture and is scorched. You kind of get the picture that 
that they hear the word, they hear the frequency, they hear the sound that Jesus died for me and forgave my sins and he grants me eternal life. And it's awesome. Where do I sign up? And they sign on the dotted line. They tune into the frequency of God's voice. They hear him call their name. They respond. How wonderful. But then there are rocks. But then there are distractions. Now these distractions, these rocks, they can represent a number of things. The life of busyness that compete for our time, our energy, our affection, our love. So many ways. And I've, just, I've, I've broken this down, and this is just extra. I've broken this down into three categories of distractions. And again, you can label them any way that you want. And there are probably more. But it's, it's really deep. The first one is not good things. It's pretty heavy. There's not good things that distract you. There's not good things that are rocks. There, there is sin. These rocks can represent those tendencies of point one, those tendencies of thinking, feeling, and doing, and committing things of your old life. It's an outright distraction, the pride, the greed, the lust. You can, you can fill in the blank. It's giving in to those temptations. And how many know when we give in to those temptations, there's repercussions for that? Get this, sin distracts you from hearing, growing, and producing fruit. Let me say that again. Sin distracts you from hearing, growing, and producing fruit. It is not, not, there are not good things. The next category of the three, there's not good things, and then there's good things. There are good things that can distract you. There are lots of things that get in the way. You could put next to this busyness, your schedule, your expectation with your schedule, your list upon list upon list. How many of you are list people? And your list have list, and then a sub list, and then a page two, and an iPhone note, and a reminder, and then a reminder for your reminder of the list, of the things that need to get done on your schedule. And I'm not saying throw away those lists. How many of you are procrastinators? You got one list and you venture about 3 a.m. where you work best. I work well under pressure. You list the procrastinators. I, I, I tend, I fall in that. But I get really busy in that season and there's this pull and this busy in this way. And whether you have list or you wait for your list, life, life is busy. There's two people we refer to a lot when we talk about good things. And it's the story of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. There's these two sisters, listen, that were in the same proximity of Jesus. But they both have two separate experiences. Mary, it says that she sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted by so much good things, so much serving. It's crazy how good things can get in the way. Take my time, steal my day. Keep me from hearing the Lord's voice, from tuning in. Keep me from getting roots with other people, roots in his word. In the third category, we have not good things. We have good things, but this one's more of a bonus, and it's a little heavy. But I believe it applies to where we are in our day. It's the lack of surrender. There's this picture of the soil, and it receives a seed of the word, and it says then testing in this testing, in this trial, they fall away. See, I think what happens if we're not careful, we take the most selfless act that's ever been committed or will ever be committed, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, and we make it a selfish pursuit about our agenda. Luke 9, one chapter later, Jesus is describing what his followers must do if they wish to follow him, if they wish to be his disciple. He says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must what? He must deny himself. He must surrender himself, take up his cross, not once, not one quick prayer, not one, one and we're done, not I hope. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Paul echoes in Galatians 2, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer me, my, my stuff that live, but it's him, his purpose. He lives, but Christ who lives in me. Again, in Galatians 6, he says, far be it from me to boast in my stuff, far be it from me to boast except for anything but the cross. 
In fact, I've crucified to the world. I'm crucified to the things of this world. You see, here's the struggle. Sometimes we give this teaching. There's a little validity to some of it, but sometimes we give this teaching that only focuses on the benefits of discipleship and not the cost. We start to preach, your life is Jesus incorporated. Just add Jesus to the list. Add Jesus to the things you procrastinate on. Add Jesus as just another another thing rather than Christ alone. See, we don't incorporate Jesus When we confess him as Lord, he rules and reigns over our life. He actually becomes our life. When Jesus says, deny yourself, he's he's saying, are you willing to abandon everything? Listen to this. Everything that you think is right, everything that you feel is right, all of your conceptions, all of your conclusions, all of your attitudes, all of your preconceived notions, all of your political beliefs, And be remade. How many thankful? Be remade, be renewed, be reshaped, be refilled, be reinformed by the Holy Spirit and his truth, his word. And so we have these rocks. Not good things, good things in my agenda, my pursuit. And many of us leave the rocks. And it says that the thing about these roots that want to go deep, they can't go deep. Now, when I think of roots, just a little extra, I think of roots going deep in two ways. If you think of roots and and that field of wheat or that field that they are producing, these roots will intertwine with one another. So the first, roots go deep in community. And here's the crazy thing, where we are in our culture and where we are, we are seeing a lack of genuine relationship and community being developed. And the call is to, to have deep community to be intertwined. And because of that lack, We are not teachable, we're always a victim, we're never wrong, we're never in community, where iron is literally sharpening us and and scripture is spoken to us out of love. Discipleship, part of discipleship is correction and community and love and speaking that love in truth. And now we're, we're in a world where you speak something that I don't like Well, that just doesn't agree with me. And we're on to the next relationship, the next church, the next small group, the next thing that will give our itching ears what we want to hear. And it's dangerous. And the roots never grow deep because I'm never accountable to anyone in community. Next thing it says, the roots roots go deep into a foundation of the word. Remember Jesus, he describes that parable that there's two houses, right? Right? There's one on the shifting soil and there's one planted on the firm foundation, the rock of Christ Jesus, his word, his truth. And it's not just a Bible that I check in and check out of, but it is my life source. It is my love letter. It is my roadmap. It is all scripture as God breathed. And when you root into that, you can't skip over the pages that you want to skip over and do that. Like we, we live in that where we dismiss part of the scripture. Well, that was meant and we don't take it. And, and our roots never grow deep. So when the storm comes, we are, we are withered because we're not rooted in the word and we're not rooted in community. See, that sun is that temptation. That sun, that testing, that scorching is, is the trial. And there's all these rocks and there's all these distractions that keep you from out of the word and keep you from being vulnerable with others. And you undergo a trial and all of a sudden, and you'll see this in so many people's life, all of a sudden we're in a trial and it doesn't fit with my preconceived notion of God. So I decide that the God I created in my own image is not worth following, is not loving, is not good. And what happens is we see so many people get withered in the trial. Because there's no community, there's no word, the roots don't go deep. So your faith is weak, shallow, and and it says incapable of persevering. The path is polluted, the rocks are distracted. And number three, the immature heart. If you look, other seed fell on the thorns, which grew up and choked the plant. 
Then he describes this in verse 14. He says, what this means is that the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, as they live in this world, as they live in this life, as they go on their way, they are choked out by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Anyone like gardening or farming in here? Online? Only about six of you. Understand, it's 110 degrees outside in South Carolina. If you're new here, welcome. That's called humidity. Can't breathe. Don't do gardening now. It's not, it's not good. I can barely cut my grass. If you're, if you're a gardener, you, you plan, right? You plan your bed out. You plan the things out. You plan what's going to go where. You got the farmer's almanac when you know to plant, the time and the season you know to plant. And it's very specific. You got that thing all tilled up and, and, and you do that. There's one thing that you never have to put seed in for. What is it? Weeds. The little bit that we do, I'm like, one week later, where did that come from? Is that the thing I planted? I'm not sure what it looked like. I'm pretty sure that's a weed. Some of my grass has creeped in. It's, it cro- it's there. We don't have to plant it. it. It comes up and it chokes out. Often because of neglect. Look at the progression. Thorns and weeds choked the plants. Lies, worries, pressures, pleasures, pursuits, cares of this world choke. In the world we live in right now, I don't know about you, but there's this pressure. There's a pressure to control, a pressure to obtain, a pressure to keep up in so many areas that we deal with. I mean, you know, it's just like, man, we gotta make a lot of decisions, I feel like, on, on a daily basis from the finances to the family to the house to the job to the kids at school to the church to the ministry involvement. And it just happens where life, I don't know about you, it just gets crazy. A week till school starts, it's, it just gets crazy. We talked about this a little bit in the fall and there's this pressure that at some point I have to lead. At some point, God gives me the mantle of authority to lead my home and to house and to steward that wisely and to, and to walk these decisions out. I have to be a leader and strong person for my coworkers, my neighborhood, my family, those around me. And there's this call to my ministry, but it's heavy, especially in this season. And, th- and there's yet this other side that, man, I need him every day. I can't do this on my own. I am weak. I, and, th- and there's this tension and this, and this struggle. And on top of that, there's this outside persona, this social stuff, this stuff that's pumped at us that I I want my kids to have what I didn't have and I want to live in this house and go to that neighborhood and and the housing market's crazy and and what I have with the car payment and this and and I got to keep up and I need these type of relationships and everything costs time, money, money, and energy. We, We lay awake at night, burdened, heavy, by the cares and the worry and the pursuits of the world. And as a result, stress, anxiety, depression, fear, and worry are on an all-time high. Just a little extra, this is what we pointed out in the fall. Stress is the pressure of the task in front of you. The things, the deadlines, back to school week, the shopping, the stuff that you've gotta get done, the stuff on the job, the kind of the weight of every day, the weight of the work. Anxiety is the pressure of things that are out of your control. It's the what ifs. What if we go to that school or what if we move here or what if, we, or what if the job makes cuts or, or what if this new strand of COVID or what if, and there's these, there's these what ifs and all the what ifs. And sometimes in a passage, we hear the words as a Christ follower, We hear these words of how we're supposed to live in the prepared heart, but we feel like we live, I don't know about you, but in the constant state of stress and anxiety. Battling for control, feeling like it all rests on us. I will tell you that's what causes male pattern baldness. It's heavy. Now listen to me. I think the major tactic of the enemy is to leave you choked, to leave you crippled, to have you live in fear and worry. Because what fear and worry do, 
They keep you from growing and they keep you the same. As the weed grew daily, the thorn grew with it. Man, that worry and those voices all of a sudden drowned out the goodness of God, drowned out the foundation of the word that you stand on. All of a sudden those worries and those fears start to speak louder than the community and the trusted community and the believers that you're supposed to be rooted with. All of a sudden those worries, and it has a tendency to take control and paralyze us, choke us. Now we have this picture in scripture that perfect love cast out what? All fear. And if you look at Galatians, the fruit of the spirit is love. Now, a lot of people just say love is the branch of patience, long-suffering, meekness, joy. And so the fruit of the spirit is love. That's a, a spirit-filled life produces the fruit of the spirit, meekness, kindness, gentleness, all, all those things that are in that Galatian passage, the fruit of the spirit. So perfect love cast out all fear. So I grow in the fruit of the spirit. If I flip that upside down and I live a life of fear, I no longer grow in love, joy, peace, long suffering. Now I find my life is full of anger, impatience, greed, envy, comparison, anxiety, all, all of that. Because that perfect love that I'm, I lean into, that I grow deep in, is now crippled by fear. What happens is we never mature as the spirit-filled life that we're supposed to walk in. Thorns and weeds and worry. The pursuit of wealth. To quote Biggie, more money, more problems. Like I'm telling you, even the pursuit of that, where you think you'll finally get there and you'll finally obtain that and you'll finally get enough money to have the house, to have the neighborhood, to get the thing, how many know that is just more problems? And you still find yourself empty there. It's this pursuit, it will choke you. The path is polluted, the rock is distracted, and the thorn is immature. And number four, the prepared heart. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up, watch this, yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. A hundred times more than was sown. But the seed on good soil, verse 15, what, he, what the interpretation stands for those with noble and good heart. Watch who hear the word and retain it. Who the word is the source and by it, a persevering, persevering produce a crop. That word's important. Persevering, producing a crop. Good soil. What does good soil look like? Again, prior to planting, you don't just go and dig up the dirt and put the seed in. You plow the hard ground. And in the midst of the plowing, you kick up the debris and the stuff that doesn't belong there. You disc that ground. You rake the stuff out. You get everything unhealthy out so the thing that you planted will grow healthy and produce what you intend with deep roots. I want you to get this, the counter. A prepared heart isn't hard, but a prepared heart repents. A prepared heart isn't distracted, consuming, and got an agenda, but a prepared heart surrenders. A prepared heart isn't pursuing the things of the world and the cares and the worries. A prepared heart has a different pursuit, pursues Jesus. It's not burdened by the cares. And that starts to happen, that repentance start, that, that contrite heart, that, that thing starts to happen where Christ tills stuff out of you. This is the process of sanctification. This is the process of growing in Christ. And now the roots go deep. And those roots start to connect with community and in the word. And because they're living in community and sharing life together, that when worry comes, I have now speak, people speaking truth to me. I have discipleship that's taking place. I'm no longer living this by myself. 
These tests and these distractions that are there, now I'm around people who will speak life and say, hey, look, Jason, stop being the victim. Hey, look, get your head up and get into the word. Hey, God's word says this about you, not that about you. Why are you believing this about you, Jason? And I go to Daniel, and Daniel comes down on coffee and says, brother, this is what God's word says. You're venturing off this way. And I receive that from Daniel. I don't say, Daniel, you're not my friend because you're mean to me. I receive the discipleship process, and this community and growth starts to happen, and my roots go deep. And my roots go deep. That starts to develop that. Admonishing. Sharpening. And because they're noble, the roots go deep into the word. And so now, when I face the test, and when I face a trial, I not only have Daniel to help me, but I'm standing firm on the foundation of what scripture says. I know scripture. I know the word. I know what's in there. I know he's the author and the perfecter. I know he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I know the world's crazy, but I know my peace comes from. I know where my help comes from. I know what he says about me. I know what's in there. And I stand on that as my promise, as my source, because I'm rooted. I'm rooted in that word. And so when the testing comes, I realize James chapter one says, consider it all joy when you face trials of various kind. Not if, when you face the sun, when that sun beats down on you, when that hardship happens, when your mom dies in a car accident, when life throws things at you, when that happens, You consider it pure joy because God is working something in you. The word that he used, that seed persevered. It says in James that there's a perseverance that is happening so you will be mature, deep-rooted. You will be mature, lacking nothing, producing fruit a hundred times fold, a hundred times more. So the trial doesn't become your enemy it becomes your joy. Watch. The same sun that was in soil two is the same sun that was in soil four. One just had deep roots. And the sun, the trial, is what produced. I mean, you need the sun. The sun, the trial, is what produced the fruit. Let me say that again. The trial is what produced the fruit. The test is what produced the fruit. And when I doubted, there was community. And when I doubted, my first response was not to go to Twitter. My first response was to dive into his word, saying, God, what are you doing, Abba Father? What are you doing in Romans chapter eight where I can come to you, Abba Father? You are the good God that what we heard in a prophetic word that you are here, that your grace is sufficient for me today, that you're not gonna give me any more than I can bear. So God, I trust you that you are making something complete inside of me. I've called to my friends, I've gotten in your word, and now I know whatever this is on the other side, I'm gonna be fruitful. And watch this, here's the cool part. Not only does it, produce fruit in your small group as you start to share testimony it produces fruit in your workplace because what's going to happen is they'll say to you why do you have joy when they're making cutbacks at work why do you have joy with the new strand and this and that why how can you have joy with all the uncertainty in the economy how do you have joy when you fill up your gas can when it's double. How do, you have, how do you have joy? How do you have that? How do you, how do you produce? How, oh, we didn't get a raise, yet they're expecting us to live in the high community that we How do you have joy in all of that? And you say, because I'm rooted. Because I'm rooted. And here's the catch. I have this seed, if you'll take it, that you can be rooted too. The hundredfold is key. My brother-in-law was here this past week and he's a biblical scholar. And he said something I, I never heard before. The hundredfold seed is actually referring to a person. That there was a famous farmer who produced a hundredfold. One stock of wheat would produce maybe 25, 40 kernels. And yet there was this one farmer in Jesus' generation that had one kernel of wheat that produced a hundredfold. 
He was famous. So it'd be like saying, hey, you know that basketball game? Michael Jordan, Wilt Chamberlain, LeBron, you remember that? Remember that? It would be like, hey, remember that farmer? And watch, people wanted his seed. They wanted to take his seed and put it on their field. That famous farmer was famous for producing. They wanted to take his seed and and put it on their field. And that's what happens. What, what is Jesus saying? When you allow the word and when you allow community to happen, people will wanna take your seed, put it in their field. I wanna reseed Jerusalem. I wanna reseed Jerusalem with my children who will produce a hundredfold over and over. I'm trying to reseed, which you guys don't understand, Pharisees, which you don't understand, religious leaders. If you abide in me, if you get your groups deep, you will produce not only in your home, but out in the streets and people are gonna want it. They're gonna want the message because it is good news, it is freedom, it is life, it is perseverance, it is peace, it is joy, it is where I am found. We don't do groups to give you guys another thing to do. We're pushing, you'll have a group fair out there the 15th, the following week. We'll launch community groups. We've got men's groups, prayer groups, women's groups, life groups, fellowship groups, hangout groups, basketball groups, outreach. We don't, we don't do that just to give you another thing to check off your schedule as a good Christian. We do that because you need people because you're designed to be vulnerable, you're designed to go deep, you're designed to receive correction and discipleship and things that can happen in, in a community. We don't just do prayer and fasting week, which is what we're starting on the 15th, just to make you lose weight. Just to give you a little devotion in the morning and a little thing at night. We do that because your pattern has to be the word. Your spiritual discipline is important in the word. Reading the word, meditating on the word, taking a spiritual discipline like fasting where I say, God, I'm, I'm only craving you and your will and your purpose and your peace and your, I'm, I'm taking away all my flesh, I'm dying to that and I'm getting close to you. We do that, it's on purpose because we care, you need to go deep. Outside of a Sunday morning experience, outside of an online experience, online church, outside of it, you gotta go deep with people and in the word. I'm telling you, when you do that, the frequency will tune. God will use others and he will speak to you through his love letter. You got, I, uh, I did teenage ministry for about nine years. And I used to tell the teenagers, this book is God's love letter to you. Anybody remember middle school? Five of you. <laughs> middle school back in my day, we didn't have phones where you text all the stuff. We actually had notebook paper. Just like the radio, we had notebook paper. Sometimes we would listen to the radio with our notebook paper as a thing. And you write that love note to that person in school. Do you like me? And then you draw a box, check yes, Man, we didn't want the second one. Check no, or maybe. We even put a maybe in there to up, to up the odds. And man, you would receive that letter and you'd be like, look at how they wrote maybe. <laughs> look at the way the Y curls. Look at how he signed his name. He put a heart above the I and like. What does that mean? And you read that thing and you folded it up and you showed it to the friends and you read between the lines and you dove in. Listen, we have a love letter from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It is God breathed. 
it is written to you in every facet of life. And what would happen if you dove in precept upon precept, line upon line, and you started reading that thing? What did you mean here, God? What was David going through here in the Psalms? Why, why can he say in the middle of hiding that you're my fortress, you're my rock, you're my deliverer, the enemies are here, but he trusts and his hope is in you? What does that mean? And you start diving in to the author of life, the love letter written to you. And what happens is, as you read it, the frequency tunes in and it starts to change everything. You get deep and now that anger is substitute with patience. That anxiety is substituted with peace. That impatience in South Carolina traffic, Jesus help us, is substituted with patience, long suffering, that pride is substituted with meekness. And this thing starts to grow and cultivate it through the word and with others. And I tune in and he changes me. Stand to your feet with me all over the place. Father, today I thank you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. God, there are so many, so many things lobbying for our affections, so many distractions, so many things going on in our hearts and our lives. Got some of us in here, we're, we're hard. This Sunday may be some people's one last chance to hear online or, or to hear in this service about your grace and about your goodness. God, there's some who are just weighed by the not good things, the good things and an agenda. And God, you're calling to surrender. And Lord, there's there's some even here who feel the anxiety, the stress, and the depression, and the fear, and everything that comes along with it, and our, our shoulders and our chest is heavy, and we feel choked. I pray today, God, that you would be the lifter of our head. Father, that, that we would hear like a prophetic word that you are here. You are here. You are Jesus full of grace. You are Jesus, the healer. You are Jesus, the hope. Jesus, the peace. You are what we need. And God, I pray as we go from this place in just a few moments, we go with a desire to be rooted with one another, take us out of our comfort zones, help us to be vulnerable again, and be rooted in your word as our love letter. We love you, Jesus.